The verse I will be reading this morning will be from Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So we went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. And the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea, and there was a great storm on the sea, so that the ship was about to break up. And the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the, hold, into the hold of the ship, laying down, and fallen asleep. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you, that you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Thank you, Tim. Great to see everybody this morning. It's beautiful outside. Lots of good things are going on. Thank you for the songs, Justin. Sounds great. So, Bible Bowl is coming up. I've been asked to announce that. There are sign-up lists at the back, and so uh, if you uh, know anything about the Mesa Bible Bowl, you'll know that we're going to have a couple hundred kids here. And uh, it takes a little bit to be able to do that and put that on. So, if you're able to, you know, make cookies, keep people, uh, different things like that, well, I know Brad would really appreciate that because it takes a lot to uh, be able to do that. And date night, I wish I had kids. Wait a minute, I've had kids. <laughs> but uh, see Josh tonight for all of that. So... Uh, we've been talking a little bit about evangelism, about what that means, and I've called it sharing the heart of God. And uh, I want you to know this is one of those things that is very, very important, and also one of the things we don't do so well. And maybe one of the things that we need to learn to do better. And so I'm dealing with a lot of my own stuff as I'm presenting some of this, so if you think I'm preaching to you, I'm really preaching to me, Okay. So, I found a clip of evangelism. How many of you remember Seinfeld? <laughs> All right, so you'll enjoy Seinfeld evangelism. We need some sound. Now we need picture and sound. <laughs> A little more sound.
So how does that interchange go and compare to what we usually do? Uh, I don't know about you, but I see a lot of similarities. First of all, why is that funny? You guys laughed. Is that funny? It is, if you can laugh at yourself, because they're making fun of us. You realize that. Uh, hopefully that's not us, and that's not the way in which we would go about it. But uh, certainly he talks about people in a different light there, people who may have uh, judgment on others and yet feel like they're perfectly fine. Yeah, they're still just hanging around, aren't they? So this is one of the things that happens with this, is sometimes we think about evangelism, we want to do evangelism, we know people are lost, but we're just too tired to save them. And it just really doesn't make any difference. And it's kind of inconvenient. Because after all, you know, if they'll do the wrong stuff, we can go along. And then, is that right? I'm not sure that's right. So maybe we're looking at sharing your faith, and this is kind of what not to do. And I think sometimes we find ourselves in a very dark place realizing that, okay, this is how I think of evangelism, but not how evangelism should really go. Uh, we may not really care about saving friends. We treat people as if, and I don't mean as bad as this, but we just kind of treat people as if, well, we know where you're going. Because we think we're saved and they're not. I mean, we know that, right? And so why is that? something that makes us superior because they're lost, we're not. Is that sharing faith? Not really sure it is. So he, David Putty tells her she's lost, right? Well, I'm not sure he's doing so great either on this part. Uh, is that effective evangelism? I'd say that's probably not evangelism at all. And so that's not the way to do it. Now, hell was discussed. And a lot of times that's kind of our bottom line of what we think evangelism is all about is we just want to get you where you're not going to hell. But we miss grace, we miss redemption, we miss all of those other things, we miss forgiveness, we miss inheritance, we miss this fellowship that we have together, and we miss all those other things as if, well, that's, you know, kind of, well, you don't have to have all that. As long as you don't go to hell, everything's good, right? Right? Isn't that, no, that's not evangelism. Until we bring people into that full measure of what Christ came to bring us, I'm not sure we've really fulfilled what evangelism is all about. And so I think maybe we need to understand what it's all about. Salvation is not only about going to hell or about not going to hell. Salvation is much, much more. Well, the biblical example that you have of Elaine's evangelism is a guy named Jonah that was read to us. And so Jonah gets a, he's a prophet of God. He's a prophet in a very good time with Jeroboam and things are going well and they're expanding their borders and uh, things are okay. And he gets a call from God that says, I want you to go to Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria. And I want you to preach against it because their evil has come up before me he immediately decides he's going to run away why would he do that why doesn't he just go why don't we just go has not God said to us I want you to go tell your neighbors so maybe it's the same reason as what Jonah does. Now maybe we're not quite the same as Jonah because we didn't plan a trip out of town where we don't have to save out of town people, do we? I mean, it's only the ones around us. Or, or maybe that's the only people we have to save is when we go out of town. And so if you go far enough out of town, we call it missions, right? And so when you're on missions, well then definitely you have to save some people if you're on mission, right? But in town we don't have to do that, or it turns out more like Elaine? Hmm. 
At any rate, Jonah decides, I'm not doing it. I don't want to do it. I don't like those people anyway. It's not where I want to be. It's not what I want to do. So he's going to run away from God. He says, he won't find me here. And so I'm not sure if he thinks he'll get very far or not, but he decides to get on a ship. He goes, great storm. He understands what it's about. And the captain of the ship sees him, and he's not praying. He comes down, why don't you pray to your God? Perhaps the God will give us a thought that we may not perish. Because all of a sudden, it's all about salvation. And when you get in those kind of circumstances and situations, it's about salvation, isn't it? And Jonah is a successful prophet in a successful nation but also a sinful nation. There's no repentance for his own nation, and now he's being sent by God to Nineveh. They're not the capital, or it is the cap, Nineveh is the capital, but it's not a world power yet, but it's not going to be very long before it is. And certainly, he being a prophet may understand that that's really what's going to happen, is that Assyria is going to come and basically wipe out his nation. And so if he understands that, if he already knows that, then he may have decided, no, I don't want to go to that. And he gives him this message. The message is, tell them they're evil people. Their evil has come up before me, cry out against it. I think sometimes we get tired of things not going like we want. And sometimes we don't care whether they're really saved or not. I mean, it would be nice if they were saved, but it's going to take a whole lot of effort to be over, go over and tell them, and they're not going to appreciate it, and they're not going to like it, and it's not going to make a difference anyway because we've tried before, and it didn't go anywhere. Another reason might be the fact that, well, they're enemies, and we don't really like them anyhow, so what difference does it make? We don't like giving second chances. Over and over and over second chances. You know how it is. You have to forgive and forgive and forgive. And we just get tired of that sometimes. And I think another reason may be that we really, deep down, believe in justice and not mercy. Because after all, we think they should be punished. They've done things that are wrong. And when people have done things that are wrong, they ought to be punished. And the odd thing about that is we believe that about ourselves. That if we've done things wrong, we ought to be punished. Not that God ought to give us grace. Not that God ought to give us mercy. And we will even go to the extent that when we see things going badly, we will begin to wonder, I wonder what I've done wrong, and now God is punishing me. See, we're not believing in the grace and the mercy of God. We're not really thinking about salvation or about the message that God wants to send. And so ours is more an idea of exactly what you see with Elaine and, and Putty rather than uh, Jesus and his cross and grace and salvation that way. So we almost believe in justice system more than we believe in the mercy of God. Because we don't accept it for ourselves, why would we share it with somebody else when we're not sure about ourselves? We don't even give ourselves grace. And sometimes when we, feel, when we engage in evangelism, I think we feel forced. Well, I have to share. Well, why? Well, it's a commandment somewhere. He said we have to go share. And so now I have to. I don't really care about him. We show our own guilt because I'm not sure I'm really saved. We share our own doubt because I'm not really sure that I'm going. And we're covered in fish vomit. Probably not going to go real well. I mean, even without the last one, it's probably not going to go real well. And so when you start thinking about that, there's nothing attractive about God. Because we go to share the fact that we have doubts and that God will punish and we don't want you to go to hell, but we're not really sure that you can be saved. Because we're not even sure we are. 
We don't even rejoice in this grace and live out this grace. And even the fact that our life has been terrible and awful in the past, we, we're still afraid. Rather than being completely fearless in the face of God to give blessings everywhere. When you start thinking about that, it's our dark place that we begin to share rather than sharing the light of the gospel of God. The good news is that people respond sometimes despite us. And so in the case of Jonah in his story, they responded in sackcloth and ashes. They prayed to God. They asked for forgiveness. Jonah did not give them hope. That was not part of the message. It was not repent and be baptized or you'll be lost. It was you're going to be lost. That's it. There is no hope. There is no chance. God is angry and uh, your evil has come up before me and God sent me to cry out against you and you're just lost. It's going to be bad here and there's a hell by the way. And so when you start looking at that, the people did repent. They did change. Even though he gave them no direction on how or way or anything. They prayed for forgiveness when none was offered. And so sometimes it happens in spite of us because God was calling them. And he sends a very unwilling prophet who does not want to go and probably did the worst job possible to reach the greatest number of people who were ever saved in the whole Bible. It has better results than any other sermon or any other place in anywhere in Scripture. 120,000 responses. That's better than Pentecost by a lot. That's huge. Because sometimes it's not about us. It's about the fact that we went, but it isn't about us. And God lets them hear in spite of our doubts, in spite of our guilt, in spite of all the stuff we're still dealing with and going through, he lets them hear the message of God. Jonah is a huge successful story for everyone but Jonah. It's, a, it's interesting that way, isn't it? Jonah never gets over it. He is the only one in the story that can't get grace. He is the only one who's still angry that people are saved. And he cannot let himself have grace. He is angry. He's upset. God, you ought to punish those people because he believes in justice more than he does in the mercy and grace of God. And so I think God gives us people he wants us to have whether we want them or not. There's a place for evangelism. He may be expecting it. I don't know if you're willing. He may not care if you're willing. But he's going to dump people in front of you and say, now tell them about me. And if you try and run away, well, it's a good thing there's not that much water in Arizona. <laughs> because there are situations like that. There are things that come up, and it is difficult, isn't it? And so I think we need to be able to understand what evangelism is really about. And perhaps we need to deal with ourselves first so that we're not the first one missing it. That we give ourselves grace. That we give ourselves a place. And that we really have encountered the joy and the blessing of God to be able then to share that with other people. There's a story that Jesus tells that I think illustrates some of this as well because the whole thing is about compassion, isn't it? Jonah has no compassion for these people. He doesn't care about those people. In fact, I don't even want them to be saved. And Jesus is just the opposite. He comes with compassion for all kinds of sinful people. And that's really more the message of God. And so when they come and they ask Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? It's found in either Luke 10 or Matthew 22, the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second is, they didn't ask for a second, but he gives them the second. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Okay. Well, the first one is not too bad because it's kind of subjective. Nobody can really tell if you're loving God or not. I mean, they can, but uh, it's really pretty obvious. 
But we don't think they can because we can fake that one enough, right? We love God. We'll even go around saying it. Oh, I love God. And you can get through that one. The second one, you love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, I haven't seen my neighbors. You know, that's always the thing. Uh, which neighbor on which side is kind of the uh, translation here. How big a neighborhood do I have? Maybe I need to move to a lesser dense neighborhood. You certainly don't want to be in an apartment or in one of those trailer things because then you've got all kinds of neighbors you're going to have to love. And so maybe we need to get away from this. But that's the question then. If he says, love God and love your neighbor, well then who's my neighbor? And he said it in order to justify himself. Well, then you know he's trying not to have to do this. And so as he's trying not to have to do this, he's, well, which neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Jesus tells him the story. And it is a story of compassion. So in Luke chapter 10, we'll take that one. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine, and then he set him on his own animal, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. So it is a parable. It is a story that Jesus is telling. It's not a real event. Uh, some of the events might be much different, but you've been around long enough where you know that that's probably pretty accurate to some real events that you've seen. Uh, people get overlooked. There's a lack of compassion in our world. It's about somebody who does not want to share. Who do I have to share with? Who is my neighbor? And so as he tries to justify himself, he does not want to be responsible for everybody else. And so the story comes out. He fell among robbers. He was stripped. He was beaten. He's in bad shape. And by chance, a priest, I love this, you know, by chance, people come into your life, right? Well, maybe it's not so much by chance, but uh, we'll go with what the story says. By chance, a priest comes by and I don't want to see that. So he turns around, he walks on the other side of the road. You ever had that happen? Somebody cross the street so that they don't have to talk to you? No, that never happens to us, right? And then a Levite, and it's the same thing. You know, it's one of those by chance again, he passes by on the other side. Those are the religious leaders of their time. And they didn't help the guy. Because we don't want to get involved we don't want to volunteer. Those are the two worst things possible. Those are almost the worst commandments you could ever have. We don't want to get involved and we don't want to volunteer. But there is a Samaritan and he comes by and he has compassion. It says he saw him. Maybe saw what he's like. He saw what he's going through. And he had compassion on him. And so he binds up his wounds with oil and wine on them. He has bandages. He sets him on his own animal. He takes him to an inn. He takes to denarii. He gives him to the innkeeper and, and says, you know, if you need more, I will be back. And just take care of this guy. He does not stay to take care of the guy. 
Sometimes that's where we end up, and what we're afraid of really is, you know, if we could set him up where we could take care of him or have him taken care of by somebody else, then that would work okay. But we know we're going to get stuck with it. We're going to have to do all of it. It becomes a dark place for us. But this guy does whatever he can. And even though he's not able to stay with him and able to do all of this, he says, I will do what I can to take care of. Now you realize also he has oil, he has wine, he has bandages, and he has money. And he has an animal. And so all of those are given in the story that he's got all of these things. But the interesting question is at the end, which one proved to be the neighbor? And he tells him very accurately. The one who showed mercy. It's not the one who has all the resources. It's not the one who has the bandages. It's the one who showed mercy. Now maybe the priest didn't have any bandages. We can make excuses for him. Right? I'm sure he just didn't have any bandages. He was walking. He didn't have an animal. He couldn't... Yeah, I know, we come up with all kinds of stuff. Either that or we blame the victim. Well, it's their fault anyway. Shouldn't have been out on the road and shouldn't have been with that situation. You know, that's a road where robbers come all the time. You got to be careful about going down that road. And so we want to blame the victim and say, well, it's your fault. You shouldn't have been there in the first place. And if you wouldn't have done that, you wouldn't be in this kind of shape. And we miss the chance to show mercy. Did God put the guy there so we could show mercy? Or did he put us there so that we could show mercy? Which one? Well, I'm not sure it matters as long as both people are able to get the mercy of God. Because that's really more what it's all about. It's always about the one who shows mercy. So what's the difference in sharing and being responsible for people. Are we responsible for the mess people get themselves into? I don't think so. We are people of grace, and we have received mercy, and we do show mercy because we have received mercy. We've received mercy because we show mercy, not because we were baptized. It isn't the baptism. Baptism is a response to mercy that has been offered. But we show mercy because we receive mercy. There's also a parable about an unmerciful servant that Jesus tells. And in that one, one owes him a large sum of money, or he owes a large sum of money to the king, and the king just forgives him because he can't repay. And then another servant owes him a small amount, and he goes and he begins to choke him and have him thrown in prison until he can pay what he owes. Yeah, the story's about a guy who got mercy from God and then did not want to give mercy to other people. No. He says, that guy goes to hell. That guy is cast out where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you want to know who goes to hell, it's that kind of guy. The guy who's received mercy and then says, no, I'm not giving you any of mine. That's a pretty dangerous thing, isn't it? So what about the unmerciful? You see, it's one of those things that's just part of the Gospels, isn't it? Jesus gives this as one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. He does not say, blessed are those who are hurt and injured, for they shall receive mercy. He says it's those who are merciful who receive mercy. And so he's expecting this to be something that is reciprocal. It's not just a, well, I'll give you mercy and you don't have to do anything. No, blessed are those who are merciful because they receive mercy. So what about the unmerciful? It's tough, isn't it? Are we responsible for others' behavior? Aren't they responsible for themselves? And I think clearly God teaches that. 
Each person is responsible for themselves. Each person is responsible for their own mistakes. Each person is responsible for the place where they find themselves. And God will punish every single person who does wrong. And each person is responsible for the things and the mess and the problems and the sin that they get into. But we are responsible for the mercy we've received. And we want to say, well, it's their fault because they deserve it. It's they're, they're the ones that did it. That's missing the point completely. It just means we're really immature Christians because God gave us that mercy in order for us to share it, in order for us to give it. And whether they're at fault for their condition or their place or wherever they are, he says that's one of the things we need to do. We need to be able to give mercy. Now how that mercy comes out is a whole other question. Jonah does not heal anybody. Jonah does not give them any kind of money. Jonah gives them nothing but, you all know you're all lost and going to hell. And that's it. Maybe there's more we could give. Maybe there's something else that could be done. But we receive mercy by the mercy we give. And I think that's what he's really trying to get across here. And that is the heart of evangelism. It's when you begin to show that. Oddly enough, that's Jesus' example of evangelism. And sometimes we just don't expect it. We believe more in justice. And we don't give it because we wouldn't expect it for us. We're just going to hope nothing goes wrong. Kind of like that insurance policy that we didn't get. And we just hope, hope nothing goes bad. Hope nothing breaks, right? Yeah, we're not that good. So how do we do this? Well, when you get your bulletin, not now, occasionally there are things to volunteer for. It's a way to show mercy. It's a way to be able to do that. Pick one and do it. You don't have to do them all because you're, then you're going to get burned out and never do any of them. You give mercy in order to receive a blessing and realize the blessing you'll receive and let yourself have the mercy that you can receive because God does give mercy hoping for relationship. So I think it's important for us to realize how all this works. Which person are you in the picture? Well, I want to be the one in the cart, right? Yeah, I'm afraid I'm the one behind pushing. <laughs> Who gets the benefit? Well, it's only about the person in the cart, after all. Nothing happens for the rest of us until you've been there and done it and you realize you feel really good about helping that person get where they need to get to. And so I think that's what mercy is all about. And all of evangelism really comes down to this one thing. Find somebody to show mercy to. Start there. Maybe it's something you say. And maybe you can get where you can get into a Bible study. Don't start with hell. All right? That's usually our first thing. Every evangelism study I see talks, well, do you realize you're a sinner? Let me tell you just how bad and create the lostness in you so that then you will want to come for what I've got. Why don't we start with mercy first? It seems to be where Jesus started and that that seems to be a better approach. I've got a story I want to share with you. This was on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle and it's about a metro transit operator named Linda Wilson Allen. And she loves the people who ride her bus. She learns their names. She waits for them if they're late. And then makes up time at a later point on her route. So a woman in her 80s named Ivy had some heavy grocery bags that was, and was struggling with them. So Linda got out of the bus driver's seat to carry Ivy's grocery bags into the bus. And now Ivy lets other buses pass to, so that she can ride on Linda's bus. Linda saw a woman named Tanya in a bus shelter 
And she could tell Tanya was new to the area and that she was lost. And it was almost Thanksgiving. And so Linda said to Tanya, you're out here all by yourself. You don't know anybody. Come over for Thanksgiving and spend it with me and the kids. And now they're friends. And Linda's built such a little community of blessing on the bus that passengers offer Linda the use of their vacation homes. They bring her potted plants and floral bouquets. And when people found out that she likes to wear scarves to accessorize a uniform, they started giving to them to her as presents. Think about what a thankless task driving a bus can look like to an hour world. Cranky passengers, engine breakdowns, traffic jams, gum on the seats, sometimes gum on your shoes. You ask yourself, how does she have that kind of attitude? Her mood is set at 2.30 a.m. That's when she gets down on her knees to pray for 30 minutes. The Chronicle states, there's a lot to talk about with the Lord, says Wilson Allen. She's a member of the Glad Tidings Church in Hayward. And when she gets to the end of her line, she always says, that's all. I love you. Take care. Have you ever had a bus driver tell you that they love you? Not nicely. People wonder, where can I see Jesus? Where can I find the kingdom of God? It's on the number 45 bus. So I've got a challenge for you. What did she do? She simply showed, showed mercy. And usually if we pay attention and notice, we will see people around us and places to give mercy. So here's the 10, 10, 10 challenge. For the next 10 days, for 10 minutes a day, I want you to pray for 10 people. That's it. Pretty simple, right? Doesn't cost you anything. 10 minutes a day. You're number one. Forgive yourself first. So pray for yourself. Number 10 is, and all those other people. So you've got eight to list in between. Be specific. Find a person. Maybe it's a person you don't even know, but maybe it's a person that you've seen. Just pray for them. Pray about them. Pray for them to get mercy. Pray for God to bless them. Pray something that will make a difference, an impact in their life. And be ready for the time when God introduces you. Because it's amazing how many times that will come along. Ten, min ten days, ten minutes a day for ten people. Has God ever shown you mercy? Maybe that's where we need to start today. Maybe it's time that he did. Has he shown you the cross and how Jesus died for you and that you can repent and be forgiven of every single thing you've ever done? And the question is, do you believe that now? There's not a single sin left. If there is, we need to fix it. So come talk to me. We'll pray about this. Maybe it's time he did. Let's stand and sing together.